Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. If you've spent much time in Lenox, you might have noticed a trend. There are a few places that share the name Kemble. And have you ever wondered why? Well, today's story is about where that name came from and why that name is so important. On November the 27th of 1809, a British couple had a baby and named her Frances Anne Kemble, Fanny for short. She was born into an already famous theatrical family who were well known and quite wealthy both of her parents were actors, and her little sister an opera singer. But Fanny wasn't sent to the stage. Instead, she was sent to a boarding school in France to study all of the feminine arts that would make her the perfect bride. Along with her education into music, literature, and poetry, she also began to write works of her own, including, in the year 1827, a play, which was very well received, considering she was only a teenager, an impressive feat. But the, her family fell upon hard times, and in 1829, Fanny was called back to live with them. Her father had taken a job at Covent Garden Theatre, but he didn't make very much as a manager. And so, he and she took part in a production of Romeo and Juliet. It was her first time upon the stage, and she was cast in the lead role of Juliet. The crowd loved her. So much so that her style of curled hair became fashionable. People wanted hats like the style Fanny wore, and her face became the model for paper dolls. A type of tulip was named after her, and sold for the equivalent of 12,000 pounds in modern money. But Fanny didn't revel in fame. Instead, she commented on the worthlessness of clapping hands. Encouraged by Fanny's newfound fame, her father convinced her to go on a tour of the United States, and in 1832, they sailed for the New World. While on this tour, she earned herself quite a few admirers, but ended up falling in love with a man named Pierce Butler. The romance continued for a short while through letter writing as she traveled, but two years later they were married in 1834. They made their home in Philadelphia. At the time of their marriage, Fanny had thought that Pierce was quite wealthy. In actuality, the bulk of his wealth was not yet his, and waited for him instead in inheritances. This wasn't the only letdown, as she also discovered that Pierce expected Fanny to take the honor and obey part of their vows very seriously. She believed instead that a marriage should be a partnership, where two equals cooperate to make a home as happy as possible. The deep love that Fanny once felt for Pierce became confusion and frustration, so much so that Fanny stormed out only a few months into their marriage, but after a while of being homeless, was forced to return when she discovered she was pregnant. And for a little while, the couple seemed to work their troubles out and welcomed the births of their two daughters, Fanny, named after her mother, and Sarah. Pierce finally inherited his fortune when an aunt passed away, leaving him great plantations in Georgia, one of the biggest being on Butler Island. These three big plantations had been the property of his grandfather, and were named for the family, the land of which sits just a little south of Darien, Georgia. They grew cotton, tobacco, and rice, and Pierce began traveling there every winter to manage his investments. But he didn't want to bring his young family, as there was a risk of malaria, as these plantations were situated in the swamplands. So for years, Fanny didn't know what her husband did all winter. And during the part of the year that he wasn't in Georgia, she assumed that he left the day-to-day -day running of these massive farms to trusted employees 
it wasn't until much later that she discovered what southern plantations were really like. You see, Fanny grew up in England, and by this point, slavery had been abolished for quite some time there. She claimed ignorance as to the severity of misery in the lives of American slaves. In 1838, the same year that her beloved mother died, she was able to convince him that her small children were old enough to travel, and that they should all see the source of their income. And so that winter, the time considered most safe from malaria, the little family went to the Georgia plantations. And Fanny was stunned, to say the least, and quickly began writing letters back to her friend Elizabeth Sedgwick in Lenox, Massachusetts. Though she never actually mailed them. She did compile them into a sort of journal in letter form, each section of which starts with Dear Elizabeth. In this journal, she describes with great heart and detail her shock at finding these plantations populated by hundreds of slaves. She, of course, knew of the existence of slavery in the U.S., but hadn't comprehended the scope nor horrid conditions. She'd heard the stories. The white Southerners at the time told themselves that slaves were happy to serve, that they were too dumb to fend for themselves, and that it was a kindness to give them purpose. But that, she was learning, was all a lie. Or was it just a way for these Southern families to make themselves feel better about what they were putting these people through? She found upon the plantation not a grand house for the master, but instead a two-room shack, one room for sleeping and the other an office for business. It was drafty and dirty and damp, and still much better than the shacks that the slaves on the plantation lived in. Her husband took her to the nearby town to introduce her to the moneyed classes of the area. As the wife of a rich plantation owner, she had to keep up appearances. She described their grand homes as shabby, full of worn furnishings, nothing like the well-kept homes of the Berkshire Hills. She called Lennox your blessed Yankee mountain village and wrote that she'd gladly trade every structure on their plantations to be back there. She also described the wealthy plantation owners as listless and lazy, especially the women whom with she was expected to spend her time. They had little interest in to talk about and mostly just gossiped. Almost right away, the task of mothering was taken away from her and given to a black nanny. She was shocked to find that after a short time, her tiny daughter was already used to barking orders at this grown woman and was being obeyed. Fanny became dismayed at the idea that a child of so young an age would be given such power over an adult. And how might that affect the child's development? The slave children, on the other hand, were ill-clothed, ill-fed, and left in the care of little girls, too small themselves to yet work the field. Their mothers were sent back to work almost as soon as they were able, and the little girls would spend their days carrying these babies back and forth from the little shacks to their mothers whenever the babies needed to be fed. These little shacks were dirty and infested with vermin. A building considered a hospital on the property, where slaves would go when they were either sick or injured, to either wait until they were well or wait until they died, was even worse. The sight of such suffering broke Fanny's heart, and she couldn't stop herself from trying to make the situation better. Her arguing for improvements and against the entire idea of slavery irritated her husband to no end, who saw little wrong with the institution. Fanny had little money herself, as her money instantly became her husband's upon marrying, which was the common rule of the time, so she couldn't simply buy what the slaves of their plantations needed, nor buy the freedom of any of them. But with what little allowance she was given, she provided for them all that she could, and spent much of her time teaching all of them that would listen how to make their lives just a little bit better. One of the biggest problems was that from the earliest of ages, the slaves weren't given the most basic in education. And I don't mean reading and writing. That, of course, was absolutely not allowed. But cleanliness. Fanny tried to teach them how to keep themselves clean, how to keep their living environment clean. But really, 
The slaves didn't have time to manage that sort of thing. They had to work. And those that were left behind, those that did have a little free time, the children were so enamored with the fact that she was paying them any mind that they paid little attention to the actual lesson, though it did get through to some, and Fanny writes of cherishing the moment that a mother approached her with her baby and pointed out how tidy the little infant looked. And they came to her asking for all sorts of things, clothing, food, time, time away from the fields, time with their babies, their sick babies. She knew a black man who asked for Bibles. Fanny asked if he could read. He claimed he couldn't, but she suspected he could. Teaching them to read was forbidden. Giving them Bibles was too. The problem being certain sections that talk about certain slaves walking across deserts to freedom. This might instill ideas in the heads of people in similar situations. Fanny seemed sickened by this double life that the slave owners led calling them dumb, saying that they needed to be taken care of, but then keeping anything from them that might educate them, that might stir in them ideas. Many of her observations were made while on her exercise excursions. Unlike many of the women in her own time, Fanny sought out strenuous pastimes to keep herself fit, horseback riding, walking, rowing. When she wasn't where it was terribly flat, she loved to hike. Fanny loved any reason, really, to get out of that small, dirty house, and she took careful note of her observations while in the far-flung corners of the plantation. This, too, offered the slaves a chance to talk to her in private. They seemed to trust her. They approached her in ways they wouldn't other white people, and, like the man asking for Bibles, seemed to understand that she was on their side. However, it was terribly uncommon for a woman to go out in the swamps alone, so she was given a sort of guide, a small black boy. It was common for women and children to be given a slave child as a companion in the wealthier sets. But Fanny was uncomfortable with this situation. However, she didn't know her way around. And he proved to be a wealth of knowledge about what it was like working on her husband's lands. She describes him with warmth and comments on his brightness, despite his lack of even the most basic education. Fanny tried for a while to stay in her place. She tried to fill her role as a wife, and in her time, wives were expected to defer completely to the opinion of their husbands. Be pretty and perky and doting and soft, but definitely not full of ideas. But the more she learned, and the more she tried to help, the more she couldn't keep quiet, the more she bugged her husband, the more she spoke out. Even after they'd returned home for the summer and had left the plantations behind, she continued to hound him about the embarrassment, the guilt she felt, that their wealth should be made off the labor of people without a choice, people treated so poorly. And soon, it wasn't just the source of their income she found embarrassing, but him as well. As she discovered that he'd been cheating, often. And the longer they were together, the less he tried to hide it. The final straw came when she discovered that her husband had taken a mistress. Sort of. He'd apparently been sleeping with one of his slaves. A rather common occurrence in southern plantations. She had commented on the disgusting nature of this open secret in the South, how the wives of such men seemed to simply play dumb, and the bizarre ease with which these men then added any children that resulted from such affairs to their stock of slaves, how because of their appearance these children stuck out amongst their fellow enslaved, but that the white people seemed to pretend not to notice. It's not known if her husband fathered any children other than his two daughters with her. It was obvious that there was no saving their relationship, but divorce was difficult and rare at the time, and it was the practice of the day that the father would be given full custody of the children. Fanny had tried her best. She had put up with so much from him, but she couldn't. She couldn't take it anymore. In 1845, she left and returned to England, where she began acting again to support herself. But she didn't get a divorce. 
that was quite complicated. So instead, they lived for a while, simply estranged. She didn't come back from England until he filed for divorce, claiming that she deserted him. The family lived again in Philadelphia, but separately, and Fanny was not allowed to see her children. During the divorce, her husband signed one of his homes over to her. This would be her part of the settlement. She was also promised two months a year with her girls. However, this was not honored. Sometimes Fanny would catch glimpses of her daughters as they were out and about in town. But the nanny, with whom it said Pierce was sleeping, was very strict when it came to making sure the girls didn't get an extra second with Fanny. As the years passed, Pierce Butler dug himself into debt and lost quite a bit of his fortune. It was for the best, really, that he had signed that house over to Fanny, as it was one thing he couldn't lose. In an attempt to fix the financial hole he dug for himself, he was forced to sell quite a large amount of his properties, which included parts of the plantations and hundreds of slaves. 436 slaves, to be precise. The slave auction was held at the Ten Broke Racecourse and was the largest such auction in the history of the United States. Slave families were split up every day. This would be no different, but the idea horrified Fanny. She, though, had no power to stop it. Fanny continued acting, but for the most part read Shakespeare to large and adoring audiences. She was a huge fan of his and wanted to share his works with as many people as possible. As she traveled and earned a living, her daughters grew up mostly without her. Her oldest daughter, Sarah, married a man named Owen Jones Wister. Together they'd have a son, also named Owen. He'd grow up to become a novelist, like his grandmother. He's most well known for writing the novel the Virginian. Fanny took her younger daughter, Frances, called Fan, to her homeland of England. While living in England, tensions began to brew in America, between the North and the South. The South threatened to succeed, and, it seemed, America was on the brink of war. Britain found itself in an interesting predicament, a situation where it might formally recognize the South as its own country, and Fanny finally saw an opportunity in which she had the power to change something. No longer was she held back by her husband's decisions, or her finances, or her husband's squandering of finances to help slaves. No, now she had power to do something, and she did. Fanny took all of those letters, that journal that she had kept, those letters to Elizabeth Sedgwick and compiled them into a book. She had them published, and they were a hit in England. So big, in fact, that the country changed its mind. It would not recognize the South. Instead, England stayed neutral, and to do so meant that it wouldn't be supplying the South with any help during the war. This may have made a big difference. And not only did it change the mind of England, but it also opened the eyes of a lot of Americans, North and South alike. However, her daughter, Fan, was outraged. She was mortified that her mother would share such personal details about their lives with the entire world. And after the war, as soon as it was safe enough and she was able to travel back, she returned to Georgia to live with her father on what little was left of their plantation. In a last-ditch effort to turn a profit, Pierce and Van worked together to reorganize the farm. Van stayed with him until he passed away in 1867. At that point, what he still owned transferred to her. It was difficult, though, for her to manage the crop schedule with such little help. Only those former slaves that were interested in sharecropping stayed, and they were able to leave whenever they wanted. She met and married John Wentworth Lee, and after the couple decided that making any sort of fortune again without slave labor was nearly impossible, 
they moved back to England. Fan wrote her own true story, defending her father and their life in Georgia, entitled Ten Years on a Georgia Plantation, in which she tries to dispute her mother's journal. Fanny, too, returned to the U.S. and moved to Lenox. She'd been there before, of course, while on tour, and had spent time at the Curtis Hotel and had rented homes in the area, but decided instead to create a place across the street from Bellefontaine, on what is now called Campbell Street, a home she called The Perch. Maybe not as massive as the Lennox summer cottages were, but still quite grand. Fanny spent much of her time in Lennox hobnobbing with her friends, appreciating home and hearth, which she always loved more than the stage, and writing, the thing she enjoyed more than anything else. And she wrote, and she wrote, and she wrote, very successfully. Plays and poetry, she wrote about travel, and eleven volumes of memoirs. But as time passed, an opportunity arose that she couldn't pass up. She had reconciled with her daughter, Fan, and in 1877, she moved to London to live with her and her small family. Fan and her husband had had a daughter named Alice, but Fanny didn't slow down in her older age. She hiked and rode and traveled. She remained incredibly active right up until the very end. But on January 15th of 1893, Fanny Kemble passed away, her granddaughter, Alice Lee, by her side. She was buried in London at the Kensal Green Cemetery. A few years later, back in Lenox, in 1900, her home was demolished and replaced by a building called the Winter Palace, owned by a man named Cortland Field Bishop. In Georgia, the plantation at Butler Island is now a historic preserve conserving what's left of the vast plantation and also preserving the land for the wildlife that thrives there. A marker at the island reads, famous rice plantation of the 19th century, owned by Pierce Butler of Philadelphia, a system of dikes and canals for the cultivation of rice installed by engineers from Holland is still in evidence in the old fields and has been used as a pattern for similar operations in recent years. During a visit here with her husband in 1839-40, Pierce Butler's wife, the brilliant English actress Fanny Kimball, wrote her Journal of a Residence on a Georgia Plantation, which is said to have influenced England against the Confederacy. For some time, even long after the Civil War, Fanny Kimball was seen as an enemy of the South but the plaque is evidence that times have changed. Her writings are still widely available. You can find them on archive.org in audio and book form. Journal of a Residence on a Georgia Plantation, the letters that she kept in journal form, intended for her friend back in Lenox, can even be heard read aloud by searching for it on YouTube. The terminology used during her time can, though, seem harsh to our modern ears as she tries to describe just how horrific the conditions were. Though I encourage anyone interested in this part of our history to read or listen to what she wrote. There are also wonderful biographies written about her life, and even a movie, Enslavement, the true story of Fanny Kemble, was released in 2000. Changing the world wasn't anything Fanny set out to do. She just wanted to write. But after being unable to do anything for so long, she saw a chance and took it and became an accidental abolitionist and changed the world. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where I post images pertaining to Berkshire history almost every day. You can also find more episodes on Facebook and Twitter, and by searching for us on YouTube. You can find every episode we've ever made by visiting our website, www.theberkshiresgoneby.com, where you can find even more pictures pertaining to each individual episode. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.